Inshallah, tonight we're starting a new series. So sorry about my voice. I'll do the best I can. Recovering from a cold. Um, the, the title of the class is Selected Readings From and Reflections Upon um, a world-famous text um, on prophetology called Kitab al-Shifa by Qadi Iyad ibn Musa rahimahullah ta'ala. <clears throat> Um, the, and we'll start promptly at 7 uh, every week, and then we have to end right at 8. Uh, so I'll go through the text, and you can ask questions as they come up. Just raise your hand, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so the, the, uh, the text is four parts. Uh, the fourth part of the text is on the ahkam, the legal rulings. Uh, we're actually going to skip this part. It requires a lot of uh, contextualization, a lot of commentary. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this class. Uh, the first three parts we will touch upon. The first part is concerning the descriptions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the Quran and Hadith. It's four chapters. <clears throat> the second part is concerning the rights which people owe to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's four chapters. The third part is concerning belief in the Prophet, so aqidah, prophetology, uh, the wajibat, the mustahilat, and the mumkinat, the ob obligatory, the inconceivable, and the conceivable attributes of any Prophet, really. And that's two chapters. So the first part has four chapters, the second part has four chapters, the third part has two chapters, so that's ten chapters. We have ten weeks. So we'll take a chapter a week, inshallah ta'ala. Um, we're not going to read through the entire chapter, it's just not enough time, so I will highlight some basic or main points, textual highlights of each chapter. Um, the main thing is just to read the text. Millions of people have this text sitting on their bookshelf at home, but people don't read books. Uh, that's just the human condition. The vast majority of books around the world are never read. So a gathering like this is simply an opportunity for you to relax and listen uh, to someone else reading the text, inshallah ta'ala, or at least a portion of it. <clears throat> so we'll begin, inshallah ta'ala, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we talk about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have to be sort of weary of our uh, intentions, um, that we should be, uh, we should sit um, uh, in a respectful way, we should pay attention. When Imam Malik ibn Anas was approached by students, they would ask him, let's study fiqh, and he would immediately begin giving them lessons. And they would ask him to study hadith, he would actually go and take a shower, he would put on clean clothes, he would apply perfume, uh, and he would, he would uh, he would teach the hadith, the, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with the utmost respect and reverence. <clears throat> and he expected his students to also have that type of reference, uh, reverence. Inshallah ta'ala. So chapter 1, <clears throat> Allah's praise of him and his great esteem for him. So he says here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ A messenger has come unto you from among yourselves. This is the famous ayah in Surah At-Tawbah, ayah number 128. The commentator here actually has a, a footnote saying that there's a, a variant reading of this ayah. مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ means from among yourselves, but there's another reading um, which is not as strong. It's a shad reading. So it's um, anomalous. It's, uh, it has the strength of a hadith. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفَسِكُمْ أَنفَسِكُمْ Rather than أَنفُسِكُمْ Both are correct in meaning, but أَنفُسِكُمْ is tawatur. It's multiply attested, so only this can be recited in prayer. But أَنفَسِكُمْ is the superlative of nafis, which means precious. So the ayah can be understood. A messenger has come unto you. Uh, from the most precious among you. That the Prophet وسلم, is the most precious of human beings. <clears throat> now, Qadi Iyad says, 
Allah informs the believers or the Arabs or the people of Mecca or all people, according to different commentaries on the meaning of these words, that he has sent to them from among themselves a messenger whom they know, whose position they are sure of, and whose trustworthiness and truthfulness they cannot but recognize. So reputation and integrity are extremely important. Um, it was Aristotle who said that there are three modes of effective persuasion. If you want to persuade someone of a point that you're making, you should have a logos, and that's basically strong reasoning. You should make sense. You should have pathos, which is an appeal to emotion. So you're not sort of monotone. I'm very monotone, I guess. Uh, that's why it's important for there to be some sort of emotional connection with the speaker. And then ethos. Ethos is uh, the integrity of the speaker himself or herself. That this is extremely important. The Prophet Wasallam, he was nicknamed by the Quraysh before the Wahi, before the, the descent of the Quran. He was nicknamed as Sadiq al Amin. <clears throat> so, this is someone who is recognized amongst all the Arabs as someone who is truthful and trustworthy. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him in the Quran to remind his people Faqad labithtu fikum umra min qablihi, that indeed I have lived an entire lifetime before this. In other words, look back at my life. There was nothing that they could point to in the past and say, now you're claiming to be prophet. What about when you did X, Y, and Z in the past? What about that? And this is a problem people have today. Even people who make toba and they move on, there are other, there's always going to be people who are going to look in their past. What about when you said this or did that? Right? The prophet's reputation is without question. <clears throat> no one can point to anything in his past. So this is something that they recognize. He says, therefore, since he is one of them, they should not suspect him of lying or of not giving them good counsel. There is no Arab tribe without descent from or kinship with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. <clears throat> this, according to Ibn Abbas and others, is the meaning of his words, except love for kin. So he's, he's mentioning, he's, he's, uh, he's partially quoting an ayah from Surat Shura, Chapter 42, verse 23. It's a very famous ayah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Say, so the qul is an imperative to the Prophet sallallahu Say, I do not ask for any type of reward for this except for love of kin. And Ibn Abbas says, the meaning is something like, O oh, Quraysh, you should keep good relations between you and me because we are all kin. In other words, if the Prophet ﷺ is honored, then Quraysh will be honored because he is from the Quraysh. Other exegetes like Ibn Ajiba and Imam al-Qurtubi, <clears throat> they say that this ayah is a reference to the Prophet's Ahl al-Bayt, the family of the Prophet ﷺ, that this is an imperative in the, in the Quran to love the Prophet's family. Imam al-Shafi'i said, uh, Ya ahla bayti Rasulillah, hubbukum fardun alayna fi kitabillah. O people of the prophetic house, uh, love of you is obligatory upon us according to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is the noblest, highest, and most exalted of them. And then he asked a rhetorical question, how much further in the ayat can praise go? Then Allah continues the ayah. This is again ayah 128 of at tawbah Then Allah goes further by attributing to him all kinds of praiseworthy qualities and greatly praises his eagerness to guide them to Islam, his deep concern for the intensity of what afflicts and harms them in this world and the next. So, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ And then, عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِدْتُمْ There is coming to you a messenger from among yourselves, it grieves him that, that you should perish. Harisun alaykum. He's deeply concerned over you. He is very covetous over you. And the ulama say here, many of the ulama say here that this part of the ayah is general, it's am, that this concern of the Prophet is for humanity at large. And then it becomes more intimate, more khas. Bil mu'minin ra'ufur rahim. 
He is to the believers compassionate <coughs> and merciful. So there's a special type of mercy the Prophet ﷺ manifests for the mu'mineen, for the believers. Of course, there's a famous hadith in Bukhari, is one of my favorite hadith, which uh, exemplifies this. Um, that a man broke his fast in Ramadan. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, my wife and I couldn't control ourselves. We broke our fast during the daytime in Ramadan. As uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, free a slave. And he said, I can't afford to do that. And then he said, you have to fast for 60 consecutive days. And the man said, I can't even fast three days of Ramadan. <laughs> and he said, uh, then you have to feed 60 people. He said, I don't have anything. With what? And so the Prophet ﷺ, he went out and got him a big basket of dates. He said, here, take this and feed people. He said, you know, there's nobody more poor than my own family. And then the hadith says, فَضَّحِكَ nabi." The Prophet ﷺ, he smiled until his molar teeth were showing. And he said, then feed your family with it. Right? بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ rahim." <clears throat> One of the men of knowledge, Al Hussein ibn Fadl, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him with two of his own names. So, Ra'uf al Rahim are two of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are given to the Prophet. So, this is, um, this is the sort of uh, goal of this life, the telos of this life, what, what philosophers call the final cause of our lives in the earth is to become a saint. The goal is wilaya. The Quran says, Kunu Rabbaniyin. Become lordly. In other words, to mirror the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a human level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-Rahman. No one can be ar-Rahman. Right? That is the, the most compassionate and absolute and infinite sense. But we can become people of Rahmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Afu, the one who forgives. And we can have that type of personality to forgive people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is As-Salam. As-Salam does not mean the peace. As-Salam means the perfect when it relates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can strive for perfection in our akhlaq. Every one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can appropriate right, uh, uh, into our lives. This is called, this is called takhalluq. Right? Even a name like al-Jabbar, the compeller, how do we appropriate that name? How do we, the compeller, are we supposed to compel people? Well, if somebody commits a crime, the ulama say, then we compel that person to stand trial. Al-Mutakabbir, the one who deems himself big, right, are we supposed to manifest this name? How do we manifest? I asked one of my teachers, and he said, imagine someone's insulting you, but you don't return the insult. You walk away. You deem yourself better than his action, not better than the person. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the heart. In that sense, we can manifest the name of Allah al mutakabbir And there are many ulama write books on this topic. Al-Ghazali has one, Imam Suyuti, and many, many others, Ibn Ajiba. <clears throat> The Prophet ﷺ, Ra'uf rahim It is related <coughs> by Sayyidina Ali that he said the words of Allah from among yourselves means by lineage, relationship by marriage and descent. There was no fornicator among his forefathers. From the time of Adam, all of them were properly married. There is no zina in the direct ancestry of the Prophet ﷺ. Many of the ulama also maintain, and there is a difference of opinion about this, Many of them also maintain there's no idolatry in the direct ancestry of the Prophet ﷺ. <clears throat> there's a hadith that's quoted by Imam al-Haddad. The Prophet ﷺ is quoted to have said that I was passed from pure loins to radiant wombs. Pure loins to radiant wombs until I manifested. Of course, the Quran says, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ najis." The mushrikeen are filthy in the sense, spiritual sense. <clears throat> There's the question of the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Azar clearly is a mushrik according to the Quran. 
Well, there's an opinion that this is not his biological father. The biological father of Ibrahim salam was not Azar. It was a man named Tariq. And this is what Ibn Hisham says in his seerah of the Prophet sallallahu that his name was Tariq, and this is actually also, although this is not a definitive source by any means, but Israelite tradition, the Torah, the book of Genesis, also mentions his name as Terah, not Azar. So when Ibrahim salam says, Ya Abati to Azar, Ab, your uncle can be your Ab. So many of the ulama maintain that this is actually his paternal uncle. It's not his biological father. In the Quran, they use the ayah as a proof text when Yaqub asked his sons on his deathbed, Ma ta'buduna min ba'di, what are you going to worship after me? And they said, Na'budu ilahaka wa ilaha aba'ika Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq. We will worship the God of your God, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Ismail, who is their uncle, and Isaac. <clears throat> so they use that also as, but there's a difference of opinion about that. <clears throat> Ibn Abbas said that the words of Allah, when you turn about among those who prostrate, so this is in Surah number 26, a Shu'ara, verse 218 and 219, الذي يراك حين تقوم, the one who sees you when you stand, and you're turning about in those who make sajda. Allah sees you when you stand to pray, and He also sees you when you turn about. Taqallub. Amongst those who make sajda, Ibn Abbas said uh, that the meaning of this is from prophet to prophet uh, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you out as a prophet. In other words, a reference to the prophetic light that was uh, um, among the mu'minin from his ancestors. From Adam alayhi salam, the light moved to Seth, which, amid, uh, which um, uh, uh, found its way to Nuh alayhi salam, eventually to Ibrahim, to Ismail, eventually to Adnan, and eventually to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq, he said that Allah knew that his creatures <coughs> would not be capable of pure obedience to him. So he told them this in order that they would realize that they would never be able to achieve absolute purity in serving him. Between himself and them, he placed one of their own species, clothing him in his own attributes of compassion and mercy. So the, the language here is a bit mystical. It doesn't mean that the Prophet ﷺ is some sort of divine incarnation. The Prophet ﷺ is an exalted manifestation of Allah's attributes of beauty. That's how we can think of it. He brought him out as a truthful ambassador to creation, and made it such that when someone obeys him, they are obeying Allah. And when someone agrees with him, they are agreeing with Allah. Allah says, مَا يُتِعَ الرَّسُولُ فَقَدْ أَتَى Allah." Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 80. Whoever obeys the messenger is obeying Allah. There is a non-distinction in obedience. It is impossible to be in obedience to Allah and disobedience to the Prophet ﷺ. Their obedience is equal, yet there is an ontological distinction, meaning an essential distinction, meaning that the Prophet ﷺ is ontologically, essentially inferior to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Prophet ﷺ is not a deity. He's not divine in that sense. He's not a god. He is the best of creation. Yet when one obeys the Prophet ﷺ, it is as if they are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Prophet ﷺ only speaks the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of his speech is wahi. All of his speech. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ مَا يَنْتِقُوا In Surah Al-Najm. مَا means never. He never speaks from his hawa. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَىٰ عَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْقُوَىٰ Whatever he says is nothing but wahi, revelation. <clears throat> Even one of his companions, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, asked him, shall I record? Initially, he, he commanded them not to write down the hadith. But then later, when um, <clears throat> it was, uh, there, was, there was a clear distinction to be made between Quran and hadith, 
he had scribes that would write down some hadith. So one of the scribes asked him, what about when you're angry? Shall I write down the hadith when you're angry? Uh, and he said, وَالَّذِي بَعَثَنِي بِالْحَقِّ By the one who, who uh, raised me uh, in truth, the one, the, by the one who made me a prophet, لا يخرج منه إلا الحق. Nothing comes out of this, meaning his mouth, except the truth. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ <clears throat> Does anyone know where this is in the Qur'an? Everyone has to know where this is. You know, if you meet a Christian on the Bart, he's going to quote John 3.16. Every Christian knows John 3.16. What surah is this? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ No. Good guess. Al-Anbiya, surah 21, verse 107. 21-107. This is a quintessential verse, the quintessential prophetological verse. We did not send you except as a mercy to all creation, to all the worlds. And he says here that many of the ulama, they point out that his very being was mercy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a noun in the ayah and not a verb. He doesn't say antarhama or something. He doesn't use a verb. He uses a noun. And a noun or a mustar, an infinitive, describes the essence of a person. The essence. So if you use the verb, a verb could mean at some point in time, right? It's descriptive, but it doesn't describe necessarily the essence of someone. Someone could be merciful sometimes, and a tyrant other times. If the verb is used, rahmatan is the mustar, is a noun. <clears throat> and then also the statement. It's very strong in Arabic rhetorically. It's, a, it's an affirmation after a negation in Arabic. It's called the ifbat ba'da nafyin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said that, you know, that I sent you as a mercy. But he said, we did not send you except as a mercy. So this is a very strong statement in Arabic rhetorically. It's like the shahada. We don't, our shahada isn't Allahu mawjud or something. Allah exists. Allahu wahid. It's la ilaha. There is no God illa Allah except God. If bad, bad nafyan. Affirmation after negation. Very, very strong statement. It's difficult to translate. Qadi Iyad mentions the hadith here from Al Bazar. My life is a blessing for you. My death is a blessing for you. Hayati khayrukum wa mamati khayrukum from the Prophet ﷺ. How is his death a blessing for us? Well, in his grave, ﷺ, he continues to supplicate for the ummah. And salawat are conveyed to him on Fridays by malaika. Uh, sorry, all the days except for Friday, they're conveyed to him. And on Friday, he actually, he actually hear the salawat. He says in the hadith, sound hadith, he hears the salawat with his own ears and responds with his own tongue. That's in this world. And then what follows after death is the, the great shafa'ah of the Prophet ﷺ on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This is how we understand my death is good for you. He's, I mean, this is just the first two pages. <laughs> There's so much in this text. It's amazing. Let me see how we're doing. Any, any questions? Anyone need clarification? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. All right. Ah, then he quotes this famous ayah to Nur. This is an amazing ayah. You know, when I was 17 years old, a bit late, but it's the first time I read the Quran. <laughs> it's in English. I didn't know any Arabic. I didn't know Alif from Ba. I read the Quran and, <clears throat> you know, I, I think I understood every verse in the Quran. Probably half of it was wrong, maybe 90%. But I think I understood something from it, except for this verse. I had no idea what this verse was talking about. Ayatul Nur. This is also called the parable of the shining lamp. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Allah is the light. In logic, this is called an analytic statement. So the, the predicate uh, is a definition, basically, of the subject. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. It's also, it's also called a cataph cataphatic statement in theology. Cataphatic means a positive statement about God, as opposed to an apophatic statement, which is a negative statement about God. For example, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ them is a negation. And that's the safer way to talk about God. It's to say God is not this or that, rather than God is. So cataphatic statements are rare, but we have them in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can say whatever he wants about himself. So he says, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> and the meaning of this, according to Suyuti, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of all light. <clears throat> the source of everything. And then he says, مَثَلُ nurihi." The similitude of his light, a light that he owns. This is not an analytic statement. This is a construct statement. Nurihi means a light that he owns. So the ulama here, they point out, Ibn Abbas, Imam al-Razi, Imam al-Suyuti, they say light here is a symbol for the Prophet ﷺ. That the parable, the shining lamp, has something to do with the Prophet ﷺ. The likeness of his light is like a niche. Therein is a lamp. The lamp is in a glass. Does everyone understand what a niche is? In these pre-modern homes, you would have sort of a dugout in the wall. You would place a lamp and it would light up the whole room. A lamp inside of a glass. That's called a niche or a niche. And both, of, both pronunciations are acceptable in English. So this is what Razi and Suyuti say. That the niche represents the sadr, the chest of the Prophet ﷺ. And the lamp within the niche is iman, is faith. And the lamp is in a glass, zujaja, that is the pure heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And zujaja tuka annaha kawkabun durriyun yuqadu min shajaratin mubarakatin zaytuna. The glass as uh, the glass as if it were a, a glittering star kindled from a blessed olive tree. So the glass is so, uh, is so pure, is so shiny, right, um, that, it, that it, it looks like a, like a brilliant star, I meaning the heart of the Prophet is so pure, it's been so purified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the diseases of the heart. Kindled from a blessed olive tree. The olive tree here, according to this symbolism, is a reference to Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is a forefather of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La He's not from the Orient or the Occident. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the father of all nations. That's what his name literally means. Yakadu zaytuha yudi'u wa laulam tamsashu nar Whose oil would nearly shine even if no fire touched it. Now oil is that which is internal or natural to the lamp. That which is internal or natural to the human being is reason, is conscience. Conscience in Latin, con means with, and science means knowledge. Or fitra, there's an innate disposition. That the conscience or the prophet's sense of reason, his fitra, would almost come in, into the state of ma'rifah even before the fire touched it. And fire here in this symbol means revelation, wahi. That Ibn Kathir, he says, the prophet shone, he shined, even before the revelation touched him. Right? And this is what Bahira, the monk, noticed. When the prophet ﷺ was 10 or 12 years old, he traveled to Bostra with Abu Talib. And Bahira, the monk, he noticed there was something happening with him. Pre-prophetic miracles, irhas, they're called that through his intellect he would almost come to ma'rifah, to intimate knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though the revelation never touched him. The sages from Ahl al-Kitab, they knew before the Qur'an there was something special about him. That's the meaning of it, even before. And then when the revelation does touch it, nurun ala nur, aqal upon naqal, 
reason upon revelation. So the lamp is illuminated with oil and fire. A lamp is illuminated with oil and fire, with that which is internal or natural to it, and that which is external or given to it. The heart is illuminated with reason and revelation, that which is internal to the human being, conscience, reason, and that which is given to the human being, revelation. This is true illumination of the heart, reason and revelation. There are people who reject the revelation and they worship the akala, the intellect. They think they can know everything. And this leads to a type of rigid rationalism. This leads to a type of denial of higher moral authority. That there's no moral authority over us as a nation or an entity. So we can make up our own rules. If it's good for us, then it's right. Relying on reason, you can justify anything. These people in our country, they're vermin. Let's exterminate them. It's good for us. Why not? It'll be good for us. And then you have people that lean on revelation and forget about reason. And they become these dogmatic literalists. Knuckleheads, as one of my teachers said. No akal. It's all knuckle. Knuckleheads. And they become extremely violent. Because they're looking at nos. They're looking at the text. And the text says this. That's what we have to do. Well, wait a minute. What about the maqasid? What about the aims of the sharia? What about the waqir? What about the reality of the world? How to implement? No, no, no. Don't think about that, brother. Just do it. Don't think. Just do it. Right? It's a big problem. Allahu <clears throat> alam. It's a beautiful ayah. Nurun ala nur. Allah guides his light to the Prophet ﷺ. Whomever he will, Allah makes examples for people and Allah has knowledge of everything. Ka'ab al-Ahbar. And Ibn Jubair said, by the second light, he means Muhammad ﷺ. The light of the Prophet ﷺ. And he goes on to say, Sahala tustari. The lamp means his heart, the glasses, the breast, so on and so forth. What we just mentioned. Its oil would merely shine, i.e., his prophecy is almost evident to the people before he speaks, just like this oil. It's like uh, Abdullah, ibn, Abdullah ibn Salam, who was a rabbi or a junior rabbi, Bani Qurayda, Bani Qaynuka in Medina. And he just looked at the face of the Prophet. And he said, Ah, Araf to Anna Wajah who lays to be what she cut down. I can, I recognize in his face, it's not the face of a liar. Araftu means to recognize something. There's something special about this man. Right? Hassan ibn Thabit, who was paid some money by the Mushrikeen. So the Mushrikeen in Medina um, that wanted to disbelieve in the Prophet وسلم, they outwardly said they were Muslim. They became the Munafiqeen, but they were Mushrikeen. So they paid Hassan ibn Thabit write a poem and, and insult the Prophet وسلم. And Hassan ibn Thabit, he said, he's just, he looked at the face of the Prophet وسلم, one instant he walked back and he said, that's it for me. <laughs> the one glance is enough. Right? It's mentioned in the New Testament also, like six or seven of the disciples of Isa salam, Allahu alam. But it says in the text in the Gospel of John that they became disciples of Isa salam, because, they, because he looked at them. And that was it. Just the nazar, the glance. Said, oh, that's it. This is the real deal. One of the saints of Yemen, uh, Abu Bakr bin Salim, he said that the, the people from the city, they come and they sit in my presence, and they're full of themselves. They think they know things. Now, our teachers say that one of the requisites of attaining knowledge is what's known as kenosis or tahliya. One must empty oneself of things, be like an empty vessel. Forget what you think you know and be ready to receive. So he said, they come in and sit in my presence and I'll say something and they argue and it's back and forth. They don't learn anything. 
Then he said a simple Bedouin will come who will, you know, urinate in, in public. But he'll come and sit in my presence and I'll give him one glance and it'll change his life. So the Prophet Sallallahu glance is powerful. The Bedouin who came into his presence and he started trembling uncontrollably. The Sahaba said, well, what's wrong with you, man? So they're trembling. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, relax, I'm not a king. I'm just a, the son of a woman who used to eat dried meat. This is how he described it. This is from his tawadu. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. <clears throat> then here he talks about the ayah, وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ it may not exalt your remembrance. There's a long section here. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri who related that the Prophet وسلم, said, Jibreel alayhi salam came to me and said, My Lord and your Lord says, Do you know how I exalted your fame? Do you know how I raised your remembrance? And he said, Allahu alam. And Jibreel alayhi salam said that your Lord said, so Hadith Qudsi, إِذَا ذُكِرْتُ ذُكِرْتَ مَعِي Whenever I am mentioned, you are mentioned with me. In the Adhan, in the Iqama, in the Shahada. <clears throat> because a lot of people, they will confirm La ilaha illallah. Christians and Jews, La ilaha illallah. Even deists, like people who don't believe in a personal God, right? they're called deists, that there's a God, he's a creator, but he's sort of a watchmaker. He doesn't really care about what's happening on earth. He just kind of lets us do our thing, absentee landlord. They say, yeah, that, there's no God but this creator God. Fine. But Muhammad Rasulullah, this is what makes God imminent or close, loving, qurba. Qurb, ma'iyya. Uh, the fact that the Prophet the fact, uh, the fact that mention, huh? well, he mentioned the fact that mention of the Prophet is directly connected to mention of Allah also shows that obedience to the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is connected to obedience to Allah and his and his name to Allah's name. Allah says, "Obey Allah and His Messenger." <clears throat> Obey Allah means follow the Quran. Kitabullah. What does obey the messenger mean? There are people who say reject the Sunnah. We are Quran only people. Obey Allah and His Messenger. What does that mean? Obey the Sunnah. Believe in Allah and His Messenger. Aminu billah wa rasulihi. And he says here, Qadi Iyad says, Allah joins them together with the conjunction wa, meaning and which is a conjunction of partnership. And partnership here is a loaded term. Uh, don't get the wrong idea. Partnership not with respect to essence, attributes, or actions. No one shares in Allah's essence. No one is deity except Allah. No one has these qualitative attributes uh, that Allah has. Nobody, nothing other than Allah is omniscient, omnipotent, so on and so forth. Has ilm mutlaq, perfect knowledge. Think of the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. Jibreel alayhi salam, Sayyidina Umar, he said that uh, the Prophet sallallahu said to him, Atadri man is sa'il, do you know who the questioner was? It was Jibreel alayhi salam. But he asked Umar, do you know who the questioner was? And Umar said, Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. This does not mean that Allah and His Messenger have equal knowledge. Right? Because I'm thinking of a number now between one and a million. You don't know what it is. I do, and so does Allah. Does that mean I have the same knowledge as Allah? Of course not. Also, the wow of conjunction implies an essential hierarchy. Allah is the foremost. He is the greatest. Then the Prophet ﷺ. He says here, it is not permitted to use this conjunction in connection with Allah, in the case of anyone except the Prophet Why? Because again, it is 
it is impossible for obedience to Allah to conflict with obedience to the Prophet ﷺ. With anyone else, it can conflict. If I say, for example, obey Allah and obey your Shaykh, what if your Shaykh disobeys Allah? It's conceivable. So it's, in, it's impermissible to make such a statement. Now there's another verse in the Quran, Obey Allah and the Messenger, wa ulil amri minkum, and those in authority over you. So this is understood as hierarchical and conditional. Obey those in authority over you as long as they obey Allah and His Messenger. Right? Remember Abu Bakr as Siddiq, his first day of his caliphate? He, stood, he sat on the minbar of the Prophet. He said, I've been elected, but I'm not the best among you. Obey me as long as I obey Allah and his messenger. And disobey me if I disobey. This was the first sermon. <clears throat> there's something in this hadith. There's a hadith here he mentions. Someone was speaking in the presence of the Prophet And he said, Man wa rasulahu faqad rashada. Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has been rightly guided. وَمَنْ يَعْصِيهِمَا فَقَدْ غَوَى So he said, whoever obeys Allah and his messenger uh, has been rightly guided. And whoever uh, rebels against them, and he used the dual form at the end of the verb. <laughs> he said, هِمَا يَعْصِيهِمَا Right? Whoever rebels against them um, has erred. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at him according to the hadith. This hadith is in Abu Dawood and Nasa'i and Muslim. And he said, Bi'sal khatib anta. What a bad speaker you are. So the commentary says, the Prophet ﷺ, he disliked the two names being joined together in a way that implies equality. Because he used the dual form. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu Rasuluhu ahaqu an yurduhu. Allah and His Messenger. It is more befitting that you should please them, but a, it's only who, a third person, masculine singular, pronoun is used. But the meaning is understood as both of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say huma. He doesn't use a dual pronoun. Because the dual form in Arabic implies a real equality. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never refers to himself in the Quran uh, with a dual verbal form or a dual pronoun. This is subtlety in the Arabic. So the Prophet he didn't, he didn't mind whoever obeys Allah wa and the Prophet and the Prophet wa is guided. Using the dual, he didn't like that part. Don't join me with Allah using a dual form in Arabic. It doesn't happen in the Quran. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a royal plural sometimes. He says, Nahnu, right? Inna anzalnahu. anzalnahu, right? Nahnu aqrabu ilayhi min habl al warid. We, this is, this is a it's called the pluralis magistatis, the royal plural, and it's understood that this is uh, a royal plural. It's used because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking from a position of majesty. It does not in any way denote a plural of numbers, a plurality of numbers or something like that. It is related from Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet, uh, that um, and he said to the Prophet, part of your excellence with Allah is that he made obedience to you, obedience to Allah. Allah says, whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. And if you love Allah, then, then follow me and Allah will love you. It is related that when this ayah was sent down, so this, he's, he's quoting Ayatul Imtihan. This is called Ayatul Imtihan. Surah number 3, ayah number 31. 331. Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhbibkum Allah. Say, if you love Allah, then follow me. 
then Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. When this ayah was sent down, the people said, Muhammad wants us to take him as a mercy in the way the Christians did with Isa alayhi salam. So then the very next verse, Allah revealed, Qul ati Allah wa rasul Say, obey Allah and the Messenger. So obey, not worship. It's not the same way the Christians revere Isa alayhi salam. It's not to worship the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Worship is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the previous umam, people would make sajda to prophets, but that practice is abrogated. Like we read in the Quran that the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam, they made sajda to him. This was not a sajda uh, for, for purposes of ibadah. It was for ta'zim. It was, it was for reverence. And this was permissible in the previous umam. It has been abrogated in our sharia. And if somebody does it and their intention is reverence, then it's haram. If their intention is worship, it's kufr. A, man, a companion kind of went into a state and he prostrated to the Prophet ﷺ out of reverence. And the Prophet picked him up and he said, we don't do that. So revere the Prophet ﷺ because he's worthy of reverence, because he has virtue. Nowadays, we revere skill and fame things like that. Some famous sports star dies and people can't sleep for a week. And there's you know, memorials in several different countries around the world for this person whose ethics are very questionable based on experience. As we said, reputation is very important. But we don't, we don't revere virtue anymore. People die all the time that are pious, that are wise, that are charitable, that are humble, that are selfless. We don't even know their names. But Allah knows their names. This is the most important thing. Not that people remember you on the earth. This is what the pre-Islamic Arabs wanted. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They would make dhikr of their aba. They would make dhikr. They would actually come together and start making dhikr of their ancestors. And they believed that by doing that, they would somehow live forever. That's how they're immortalized. But what we want is the dhikr of Allah. But the dhikr Allah akbar. But the remembrance of Allah of us is the greatest thing. Yes? Hmm. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are aspects of cultures that are, that are problematic from our perspective. Um, I ran into this issue. I used to be a, I used to practice karate, and, uh, and you have to bow, literally make rukur, right, to your uh, sensei. Of course, my intention was never to worship anyone, but even to revere someone with such an act of genuflection is impermissible. There might be some difference of opinion about that. but um, So I, I just told my sensei, I said, and this is when I first started practicing the religion. So I was, uh, I, I didn't use a lot of tact, but I did, I was smart enough to say, you know, I'm not going to bow to anyone. And he said, oh, that's fine. You don't need to do that. You know. I mean, we, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, in, in this culture, if a man doesn't shake a woman's hand, people are offended. I told that story a while. I mean, I won't go into it now, but this happened to me one time, and somebody, this, this woman said, I'm so offended you didn't shake my hand. And, and then I turned the tables on her, and I said, my religion offends you? I'm so offended that you're offended. Yeah. So there are aspects of culture that we can certainly, like one of my teachers explained to me, like um, cultures are like different colored glass, glasses. In Islam, is like pure water. You can pour it into the glass, and you know the water, you know the water goes into the glass, so you have different color. What appears to be different colored water, but it's really the culture sort of interacting with the religion, and that's fine. But there are certainly aspects of culture that are problematic. The Prophet sallallahu he would speak out against them. There are aspects of Arab culture that he had no problems with that are actually very good. The Arabs were very uh, chivalrous people, 
Is it something that's dying now, chivalry? You know, you open a door for a woman now, and they, they, she wants to bite your head off. You know, offer a seat. This happened to me. I offered a seat to a woman on the board. I don't need your seat. Who do you think you are? Oh, sorry. All right. Um, and they were, they were very hospitable. They were generous people. But they're also prone to warfare. There are aspects of the culture that were extremely misogynist. They would practice wa'adul banat, female infanticide. And the Prophet spoke out against those aspects. You know, um, the Arab men didn't necessarily like to admit that they loved their wives. It's just sort of a macho thing. But they asked him, Ayyun nasu habu ilayk? It's Aisha. It's all. He mentioned his wife. Is that answered? No, that's the old answer. Zakal Khiran, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad and Muhammad, he was a Hafid Nani. We, we do have like three minutes if there's another question or comment one would like to make. My wife texted me, do you want a cough drop? It's too late now. So next week, we'll, uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll uh, give you the highlights for part one, chapter two. So we'll finish all ten chapters. Of the first three parts of the text, inshallah. Yes, sir. Uh, Kitab al-Shifa by Qadi Iyad. It's a very famous book. One of the most famous books ever written on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One of the most commented, com commentated upon books, probably just after Bukhari and Muslim. It's Kitab al-Shifa. He was an Andalusian scholar. He died 1149 of the Common Era. <clears throat> he was a great uh, Maliki exeget uh, jurist as well. Very comprehensive, beautiful text. You should have it in your house just for baraka. Even, even if you don't read. I mean, I mentioned earlier, people don't read books and try to do your best to read them. But even just having it in your house is, is good. Did he precede Ibn Hisham or came Ibn after Hisham? Ibn Hisham? Uh, way after. Okay. Yeah. Way Thank after. you. Yeah, he, was, he wrote this during the Crusades. And this is why there's section, uh, part four of the book is, is difficult to navigate. Uh, part of the reason is because some of the Christians, the Crusaders, would go on these martyr missions. Would actually go into a public square and defame the Prophet, وسلم, insult the Prophet on public because they wanted to be killed by the authorities. <laughs> so um, there's, there's some contextual, that's why part four is difficult. There's, there's, there's a lot of context that needs to go with it.
Amazon, is it? Yeah. It's a beautiful translation. Aisha Abdurrahman Buley. Beautiful. Like I said, we're, we're just touching the surface of this text. I mean, I promised to do chapter one. We probably read 5% of chapter one tonight. And there, there requires a little bit of light commentary. But it's an extraordinary ocean of knowledge. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.